The reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, and starting at verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him <coughs> Excuse me. from generation to generation. <coughs> he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. <coughs> May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Peter. Thank you, Dave. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? <laughs> We're fine. <laughs> it's great to see you. Great to be here. It's been a tough year, hasn't it? It's not just me, is it? It's been a tough year. It's easy to feel consumed. Dave mentioned right at the beginning about all this bad news and further frustration and angst and things. And it's, it's easy to feel kind of weighed down by all of that. And we feel sort of gloomier and gloomier, uh, a bit like the cloud that covers Cadbury Camp this morning when we were driving here. It was all sort of completely uh, subsumed. But who's celebrating? Who's had something good that's happened in the last few years? No, that's fine. Mary, go for it. No? Who? Okay. Uh, some, something that, that has caused you to celebrate during the last few months. Lisa. Two grandchildren. Two grandchildren. Woo! -hoo -hoo -hoo! Anna. Yay! Another, yeah, fantastic. Who else? Come on. We're on a roll now. Come on. Okay, uh, Esther was celebrating uh, carol services and the like with, uh, among students, yes. I know you weren't mo more, most directly involved this year, but all the great fun that, that has been going on uh, in, in our universities and the Christian unions. Anybody else? Oh, come on. Okay, all right, if you're not going to play, then that's fine. So I wonder then, uh, you're going to have to imagine, you're going to have to imagine this. How do you react when you hear good news? When you hear brilliant news? When you hear news that is so good, so unexpectedly wonderful, that it really lifts your heart? I mean, perhaps such glad tidings cause you to celebrate, to, to dance and, and, and rattle tambourines and things. Uh, perhaps I should uh, say that as soon as we can, we're going to go back to Malawi, okay? So having had, had a taste of, of, of what you saw on the screen, maybe you want to join us then. Anyway, perhaps you, you, are, you are willing, even as staid British people, those of us who are, we're willing to celebrate wildly, to dance even. Dance, can you imagine? Oh, gosh. <laughs> imagine what would cause you to do such a thing. A number of years ago, I, I read a, a report of a 16-year-old called Ryan. He'd had a dreadful accident when he was knocked off his bike, and he was in a coma. 
He was in a coma for uh, over three months and expected never, ever to recover. His parents sat faithfully at his bedside day after day, able only to hold on to an unflinching hand, to watch the, the minutes slowly tick by on the clock and fearing the very worst. Into the midst of such darkness, unexpectedly, incredibly, amazingly, Ryan opened his eyes and he just stuttered a, a few words to his parents and from there a full and complete recovery that the doctors had said was impossible happened. Imagine how you would feel if you'd been in that room. I imagine if that had been your loved one and something like that happens. Well, whatever you can imagine or remember about your own good news story, you might just respond by doing things that normally you wouldn't. If we receive the very best news imaginable, we might just rush off, dancing, celebrating, wildly rejoicing, and share that celebration with a friend. Mary's act of celebration is just such an occasion. She's rejoicing well beyond anything that she or we would usually imagine happening. God, God has appeared to her in the shape of an angel. God has come and spoken to her and proclaimed that she is to be used by him for a very, very special mission. And Mary is filled, so filled with inexpressible joy that she simply has to rejoice. And somehow, perhaps surprising even to her, somehow she finds herself verbalizing what the movement of her feet and the sway of her hips and the adoration of her heart would easily reveal to any fly on the wall. A man called Tom Wright describes this passage, which we call the Magnificat, like this. It is the gospel before the gospel. A fierce, bright shout of triumph, 30 weeks before Bethlehem, 30 years before Calvary and Easter. It goes with a swing and a clap and a stamp. It's all about God. It's all about revolution. It's all because of Jesus. In her joy, that is all about Jesus, all because of Jesus, in her joy, Mary longs to share her good news, to share her sense of celebration with someone else. Uh, and so it is that she enters Elizabeth's house and the two women immediately sing and cry and smile and celebrate together. Good news, the best news deserves to be shared. Now, Luke is a very methodical and careful writer. He's not given to flights of fancy. He, he's not going to make things up. He, he's researched very carefully everything that he writes about. And he gives no suggestion that Elizabeth would uh, know about Mary's baby or who he would be before this moment. And yet, immediately, Mary enters the house of her relative, Possibly without even having sent on ahead to say that she was coming, we read that Elizabeth's baby leapt in her womb. Communicating to Elizabeth incredible significance. And this is still very early days in Mary's pregnancy. Uh, the bump would barely have been noticeable. But still she felt the prompt to go and talk to somebody to go and share with somebody, somebody important to her, everything that had happened. And she needed to be reassured that she wasn't going mad and that it was all true. So why not, hello, why not visit the cousin who would understand better than anybody? So after a journey of four or five days, probably, Mary arrives. Gently, she pushes open the door. She calls out maybe a word of greeting. At once, 
at once, immediately, into this situation of, of total absence of tension. John's ministry as the forerunner begins even before he is born. He responds even though apparently he's isolated in Elizabeth's womb, giving her a message that is clearly understood. And in turn, Elizabeth is filled, filled immediately and overflowingly with the Holy Spirit. And with a loud voice, she pours out blessings upon her cousin and joins in with celebrating this good news. Elizabeth is filled. Elizabeth is filled with joy and, and wonder at the opportunity to share in the events associated with Jesus. And in her words to, to Mary, she expresses her own joy. She proclaims God's delight for Mary's faith. Blessed is she who has believed. Here's a model of response to all that God does for us. To be blessed is to be happy because we recognize, we delight in all that God does affecting really pretty ordinary lives. We long to see the full expression of God at work in one another's lives. And for many of us, the most joyous occasion ever was that day when our walk with God started. That moment when we knew it was true. Perhaps that moment when we switch from religion to faith. That moment. That glorious, beautiful moment when Jesus became real. And we know without any doubt that he did something. He did something that caused our insides to leap. And we realize we properly knew that things have changed. Everything has changed. That life is now different. I wonder how you responded then. But I wonder too how we respond when we see others share a similar experience. That same joy that is seen among the, the angels in heaven. Uh, it's wonderful for us to share in that as we pray God's richest blessing on those who we care about. So perhaps uh, spurred on by Elizabeth's joy, Mary brings her own hymn of praise to God from the depths of her heart. First, Elizabeth celebrates God's gracious work in her and for her, and then quickly, humbly, delightfully shares in Mary's great news. But Mary, though, seems, seems a little calmer. She offers a much more gentle hymn of praise, a little more controlled, and yet brimming over with Scripture. References from God's word that were deeply rooted in her heart and in her being. But did you notice, as you look through the Magnificat, do you notice that um, she, Mary doesn't utter a single word or phrase about her son? Isn't that strange? She's not offered a word about her son. Her clear assumption all through this hymn of praise is that he has indeed been promised and that he will indeed come in glory and in truth and in magnificence. Yet even though her whole hymn is rooted in that fact, her primary focus is on God. The God who is in control, the God who has poured out his blessing upon her. Maybe at this stage she's unsure exactly what God is doing. What will the fulfillment of this strange promise be? But just at this moment, she is focused on the God who has brought the promise. She remains content that he knows and that his will is perfect. When God blesses us, not if, but when God blesses us, 
Are we sometimes too intent on trying to know the detail? Are we too focused on trying to work out what it might mean, what it might look like? Or do we simply, generously, joyfully praise him? Lord, you've spoken. Let it be to me as you have said. A Bible commentator with the glorious name of Norval Geldenhues. <laughs> Norval Geldenhues. He highlights something of what's going on here. He says this. In this hymn of praise, Mary sings gloriously of the all-excelling perfections of God. His divine power, verses 49 and 51. His holiness, verses 40, 49, never mind. His mercy, his faithfulness in the fact that he is engaged in fulfilling his promises concerning the Messiah King and Redeemer. She sees all of these divine perfections revealed. For it is only through that incarnation of Jesus that we learn with full certainty to know God in his omnipotence, in his holiness, in his mercy, in his faithfulness. Without this, we would all have lived in the pitch dark night of spiritual ignorance. For even the Old Testament revelation gives to us assured knowledge concerning God only in the light of the actual incarnation of Christ. It's a fairly long quote, but I hope you get the point that he's making. All of this, all of these wonderful attributes to our amazing God, things that the Old Testament prophets struggled to foresee and describe, all of this is only now actually revealed in the baby Mary carries. When you look at Jesus... When you feel Jesus, when you experience Jesus, what do you see? And what do you say? What do you sing? How readily, as you gaze upon and consider all that Jesus has done for you, or all that God has done for you in Jesus, when you gaze and consider all that he's done, the love that he offers, uh, the life that he brings, the redemption that he promises, how readily do you pour out your thanks and your praise and your joy and your celebration? That's what Mary did. Uh, and that's what Elizabeth uh, does with her, filled with the Holy Spirit, drawing on those scriptures that they knew so well. But wonderfully, we, you and I, are invited to enter in to this same joy-filled celebration. Wonderfully, through the same Holy Spirit and the same passages of Scripture, we too are given the, the vocabulary and the excitement to do so. During that, that four or five day journey to Elizabeth's house, I guess, Mary was trying to put into words all that she felt and how she felt guided by the Spirit of God. I guess, I imagine that she, she was thinking through in, in a, a new light the meaning of all that Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah and others had said. She was trying to work it out. I've, I've just had an angel of the Lord speak to me. And, and this is what he told me. And I know without any doubt that this is God. How do I explain this? But now, even in the confusing reality, it's beginning to make sense. Filled with joy, overshadowing confusion and concern and darkness and gloom and depression, Mary is able to compose a song so rich of praise from these prophetic basic lyrics. But what about us? How well do we know the scriptures about Christ coming for us? How readily are we able to bring to mind what this incarnation means for us today? 
How carefully do we allow God's words of promise and praise to, to infiltrate our hearts and, and to come alive, to come alive in our own walk and in our own work. As we allow ourselves to celebrate all that Jesus means to us and to so many others, as we go on longing and praying for him to do a fabulous work in our loved ones, we too can allow scripture to bring glory and honor to God for his indescribable gift. But our greatest witness, our greatest witness to the power and magnificence of these events comes out of our lives. As people around us uh, see us and, and, and feel excitement uh, and celebration and joy, as people sense the difference that this good news really makes, this incredible gospel affects our whole lives. And then the reality of Jesus shines forth. It's all about God and it's all about revolution. As you celebrate this Christmas, how revolutionary do you feel? How excited do you feel? Just looking around the room, I guess if we tot it up, you know, how many, how many Christmases have we known since becoming a Christian? I reckon we're several hundreds, possibly thousand or two. Are you bored by it? How can we possibly be bored by this wonderful, this wonderful news? Why aren't we dancing and proclaiming and shouting and hollering from the rooftops what Jesus means to us? Wouldn't it be great to celebrate the revolution? I mean, properly celebrate, to let our hair down, those of us who've still got some, to sing and dance because we know, we know that God is using us, even us, for his glory. And we long to see others respond to the coming of Jesus with a leap and a song. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Let's pray. Lord God, we know that you have performed mighty deeds with your arm, that you have scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts, that you have brought down rulers from their thrones, that you have lifted up the humble. We know that you have filled the hungry with good things. We know that your mercy extends to those who fear you. Father, we know it, but sometimes we keep it to ourselves. As we confess that before you now, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. Please, Lord, would you enable us to be your mouthpiece, your demonstration of your goodness. And enable our souls, our whole beings to magnify the Lord across the world oh lord enable us to be a people who celebrate who rejoice and who live out the difference that you have made come holy spirit come holy spirit fill us fill us to overflowing lord amen